we've got several very interesting panelists, Colin Leduc, Dr. Amal Lee Amin, and then Gustavo uh, Montesano. Let me start with uh, Colin Leduc. He's a partner with Generation, has been for uh, a long time, since uh, 2004. Uh, prior to that, with Total, uh, then Arthur D. Little, which I think is first where I first uh, met him, and then the Sustainable Asset Management uh, team, which did the Dow Jones Sustainability uh, Indexes, and had a, you know, a big impact over a period of time. But Colin, if I can start with you, um, you've been uh, with Generation now for 17 years, if my, if my math's sort of a, uh, a semi-adequate. I mean, the world has changed so much over that period of time. Al Gore, co-founder, did his Inconvenient Truth uh, film two years later, I think 2006. What are some of the biggest trends uh, you've seen and, and where do you think we are now? Well, th thanks, John, and great to see uh, folks and th really appreciate the opportunity to contribute today. Um, I think the world has, um, you know, from a generation investment management perspective, has um, sort of you know, got to a point where the questions are starting to be asked about the effectiveness of ESG and sustainable investing in delivering impact at scale. And I think you're starting to see an emerging backlash to a lot of ESG claims. Um, a lot of, you know, some people would classify it as a pushback on greenwashing across, you know, the business community as well as the investing community and a real focus on authentic impact at scale. And really people asking the question, are capital markets truly set up in a way that will enable um, the delivery of sufficient impact? And that, that is a real question that we have been yeah. thinking about at Generation for quite some time. I think that case of um, you know, fiduciary duty uh, really needing to incorporate ESG as a way to optimize risk and return is, is pretty much an accepted case now across the market. And you know, when, when the likes of, of BlackRock and the very big asset managers in the world talk about this as a mainstream notion, I think you can you can pretty much say that we we can tick that box. So that that's been a, a twenty year journey. I think we're now at a turning point, and that is because the climate crisis continues to get worse. Emissions continue to rise. Um, you know, in, in some of the previous discussions today, uh, that has been alluded to, and science dictates the challenge. And I think we need to ask ourselves collectively in the investment community: Are we truly set up to help deliver the impact? I think we can deliver the finance. My question is whether that finance will deliver the impact. And yeah. so the UN talk a lot about a two to four trillion a year climate finance gap. I think that money is there. I just think that the way it is being deployed and the mandates and the, the targets that are being set around that capital deployment um, will not deliver the necessary impact. This notion of impact now versus impact later, I think is a very important question. And so what we have been trying to focus on a generation is, okay, how do you truly put impact alongside risk and return um, in a, as an explicit objective of capital allocation um, rather than just optimizing risk and return? And we, we feel that that is the sort of next stage and wave um, of sustainable investing as a, as a movement, if you like. And that is really driven by the, the, the worsening of the external context, <laughs> rather yeah. uh, in specifically around climate, biodiversity collapse and inequality. And you've been involved and Generation have been involved in some of these platforms in the impact investments space, like sort of gin and tonic and, and so on. And, and it's impressive to see the numbers, albeit from a small base. I, last time I looked, it was something like $500 billion uh, of assets uh, in, in impact investment. But it, are you confident that the languages uh, that people are speaking in that space are sufficiently coherent? to take this thing to the next stage? Do you feel part of that impact investment uh, space as most people understand it? Or are you trying to do something distinctly different? I think it's really about the purpose of a mandate. If it is explicitly to solve uh, a, a problem, to me, that is an intentionality question around yeah. what you're doing with your money. Um, so I think the impact investing community, if you want, is reminds me a lot of what the ESG space looked like in 2004. 
um, it's, it's very nascent, it's somewhat artisanal, it's not yet institutional grade, it is certainly not at the scale it needs to be. It is very, it's populated by a lot of phenomenal innovation and very well-meaning people, but it is way too small relative yeah. to the level of transformation that require, is required. So I think we're now at a point where we, we need to institutionalize the idea of allocating for purpose, not just for optimizing risk of return. 50% of emissions need to be taken out within the next eight years. And I think you need to ask yourself the question, are we as capital allocators set up to achieve that? Is the system just, even if the entire system adopts the current definition of ESG, mm -hmm. there is no way we achieve those numbers. Yeah. Absolutely no way. And uh, I think people have been solving for different definitions of sustainability, whereas some people feel that an incremental move towards a slightly greener approach to what you're doing is acceptable versus the what science truly dictates. It's not just the car companies and the energy companies that have to innovate their models. It is also the capital allocators. Thank you, Colin. And, and uh, we'll all uh, watch this space uh, intently through the remainder of the year. Dr. Amali Amin is um, Director of Climate Strategy at CDC. Um, CDC has been around for a very long time. It was founded in 1948. Uh, as the sort of UK's development finance uh, institution. Uh, and like many um, of these sorts of uh, development banks has sort of gradually migrated from uh, a focus on, on doing good things, but, but, but having to put up with activists, um, challenging them on some of the negative impacts, negative footprints and so on of big projects to now increasingly thinking about the positive side. Amali, if I could start with a, a, a sort of slightly challenging question. I mean, I think you came into the role uh, pretty recently, I think uh, last year, uh, and you were the first person in that role. Why has it taken CDC so long to get to that point? Yes, so um, thank you. And uh, it's great to be here and uh, talking about a topic that's very, very close to my heart. My appointment was um, was to reflect that CDC is now stepping up uh, in terms of integrating climate across the firm, across all sectors and all financial products. Um, that's not to say CDC had not been trying to do climate relevant investments. Uh, it was very much uh, that was being driven by our ESG team yeah. and um, had uh, some really quite you know innovative. Uh, investments in renewable energy platforms in India, for example, uh, combined with providing a lot of training, particularly for women. So creating, you know, good jobs for women in the renewable sector to have even greater impact, uh, you know, inclusive and social alongside the, the climate objectives. So um, that, that's very much been part of what CDC has been doing. Just a quick question. You, you, you just heard what Colin had to say. You presumably knew a certain amount about generation already. Do you, do you see what generation and just climate are doing as in a far galaxy, far, far away? Or what, what, what do you see as the links and potential overlaps? I think it's excellent. Um, you know, I, I, the reason I came to CDC from a multilateral development bank is because I'd come to the conclusion that all finance has to be about impact and impact to deliver mm -hmm. on sustainable development. The SDGs now set that framework and doing that in a way that is consistent with the Paris Agreement. And so CDC is obviously uh, an impact investor in a, uh, and closer to that that community. And I think, you know, I think everything Colin has said, it's, uh, you know, it's really resonated that the impact investing community is, you know, it's, it's uh, a very vibrant one and, um, you know, very committed, but it is still too small um, and uh, too nascent, really, considering the challenges and where we need to get to. So I think it's excellent that uh, this just climate uh, platform is going to be really uh, pushing that agenda uh, in a much more, you know, deliberative uh, and intentional way. No, thanks, Emily. And just just as I hand over to Gustavo, a question in a way for both of you is: um, We've just had the G7 summit. Cornwall was ec excited to have it, I suppose, um, uh, locally. But do you, do you see what happened there as exciting on a spectrum, really exciting through to actually quite disappointing? Where did we land? Or is it too soon to say? 
there's been a number of you know really ambitious uh, commitments to uh, fully integrate climate risk into the financial sector, uh, which of course is not sufficient. I mean, it's it's important, but it's essential that 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 is the first step to then uh, ensuring that the financial sector is then geared towards investing for positive impact uh, and addressing the climate crisis as well as uh, other sustainable development objectives. Gustavo, um, welcome. Thanks very much uh, for making the time today. You're coming in from uh, Brazil and you're president of BNDES, which is the country's um, development uh, bank. And I think you uh, joined in, well, you, in this role in 20. Uh, 19 and your 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 entry into BNDS coincided with uh, President Bolsonaro becoming quite agitated about certain issues and, and and so on. We'll perhaps come into a little bit of that in a moment. But can you just give people a sense of the size of BNDS and are you very much similar to CDC or or quite different? First of all, John, thanks for the invitation to be here. Uh, it's a pleasure to be participating on this panel. It's, we, we, and that's such a lovely topic for us, and it's in my accomplishment to, to call into Amali as well. And uh, let, just explaining BNDS a little bit, uh, I would say that we are kind of uh, CDC cousins, if I can say like that, because we are both founded uh, after the Second World War. And uh, as a coincidence, this week the bank is uh, 69th anniversary. So almost 70 years old. As any other global DFI, uh, we had a critical mission after the Second World War to industrialize and uh, build Brazil infrastructure, right? And uh, our view is that the moment uh, we, are, we are facing now, we're going through now, is a kind of similar to that uh, tipping moment uh, 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 last century. But uh, the main difference that we are, we are passing on, and I think CDC and other DFIs they are in the same uh, transition moment, is that we are moving from a one dimension, I would say, strategy, which was uh, mobilizing and deploying uh, capital and financing. And uh, if you look at, at uh, our strategy a few years ago, all our indicators were about uh, billions of reais, billions of dollars, disbursement in financial metrics. And thank you, thank you, taking uh, a colleague's comment on, on, on impact, what we are doing now is trying to reverse from this one dimensional financial metric into impact uh, metrics. And that it, it's a long term job, it's not, it's not a quick job because we need to translate uh, the strategy of the bank into the, what we call the non-financial metrics or the non-financial impact, uh, change that in the structure of the bank, and more important, in the mindset of the people that are working here for 20, 30, 40 years in a different one-dimension uh, uh, approach. We're not facing an issue of mobilizing and disbursing capital. We're facing, we're facing a gap or challenge of uh, really deploying the capital at the last mile with quality and impact. And uh, that's, uh, that's our global challenge. And we, as a sovereign and financial institutions, uh, we, we can really, really play an active and, and differential role at this stage as we did uh, on the last century. So looking forward, our view, uh, our perspective, uh, there is no, there, there won't be such a big distinguish between traditional investments or traditional companies and uh, I would say impacting uh, assets or impact companies. All the retail, financial markets, uh, agro, agro business producers, they are all incorporating uh, what we call today the impact uh, mindset and methodology. So our vision is that in yeah. five, 10 years, there will be like, uh, they'll, they'll be blended. There will be just one single uh, way of, not one single, but one uh, big uh, philosophy of, of blending or mixing purpose and uh, investing and returns. And the ones that do that more effectively will tend to be more profitable, will be here for longer, and at the, at the end of the day, will have more uh, 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 present value. It's interesting, just listening to the three of you, I just feel I should just step out of the way and, 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 and let you all sort of continue the conversation. But uh, also it's just, uh, I defined DFI earlier on, and I think from outside the world of money, 
a lot of the 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 the, the, the thinking, the models and the concepts and so on are slightly foreign. But I think we're at one of these points where everyone's going to have to come up the learning curve in terms of financial markets and 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 and, and their potential role uh, in this space uh, in future. I just wanted to say, Amali, thank you very much. Uh, Gustavo, thank you immensely too. Um, and Colin good fortune and good luck. Thank you all three very much indeed.